Thank you, thank you. All right, all right. You ready? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. I am all about practical Christianity. I'm really not into esoterical discussions and theoretical debates. I want to know what works. If it doesn't work, I'm not interested. I don't have the time for it. I want a faith that makes a difference. I want to stand before God someday and hear him say to me, well done, good and faithful. What's the next word? That's what your Bible says. The actual Greek word says slave. Well done, good and faithful slave. I want to be a love slave of Jesus that does whatever he said. You know, slaves don't have a voice. They don't have a vote. They don't own anything. They don't even have free time except what their master may generously give them. I want to be his love slave. Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. But every single New Testament writer, uh, Paul, James, Jude, John, Peter, all say, I'm, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, for sure. In the ancient world, up to half the population of the Mediterranean basin were slaves. And they got their value as to whose slave they were. If you were the slave of the mayor or the governor, you walked around and people bowed before you. Paul says, you know what, guys, I'm slave of the king of kings. I'm slave of Jesus, the most high emperor of the whole universe. Praise God. I want to do what he says. Do you know how many times in God's word, the New Testament, it says you'll be judged by the deeds you do in the flesh? Anybody want to guess? Five times in the New Testament. It says you we, and I will be judged by the deeds we do in the flesh. Wow. Come November 1, uh, I'm making a point of this since Connie's here and she needs to note this so we can celebrate appropriately. On November 1st, I have my 60th, 6-0, spiritual birthday. That's, that, that, that's worthy of some kind of Corvette or some kind of cool <laughs> gift, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. We looked at Lamborghinis the other day in Las Vegas. Um, I don't want a Lamborghini. But I'll, let me tell you something. At this point in my life, at 60 years of walking with Jesus, I've got a little bit of perspective. One of the wisest, smartest things you can ever do in any profession you're in or anything you're about is to talk to people who have been there before you and ask them just a powerful, poignant question, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were my age? When I was 24, I was pastoring a church in Hawaii yeah, suffering for Jesus. And they had a, what they call PALCON, Pastors Leadership Conference at Point Loma. And I found myself shaving. We were staying in the dorms, and I found myself shaving with two guys. I was 24, and they were in their 80s. And I said, guys, you've been doing this three times longer than I've been alive, and, and I've been in all afternoon. What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were 24? We all had shaving cream on, and they started crying. I mean, you could see tear rivulets running through their shaving cream. I knew I'd hit a nerve. And both of them said essentially the same thing. I lost my family. They were a part of a generation where they were taught, you give your first priority to the church, God will take care of your family. That's not scriptural at all. It's not even close most important members of my church are the people who live under my roof. And they said, oh, maybe they're in the church, but I lost too many Monopoly games, too many fishing trips that never happened. If I could do it all over again. And I went back a changed man because I had listened to men who had been further than me. Can I suggest to you at 60 years in, I'm going to tell you today the two biggest regrets that I have. I found that my children listen better. Rather than when I tell them what I think they ought to do, when I tell them the screw-ups I made, when I tell them about the mistakes, the sins I made, my kids pay real good attention, okay? And at 60 years in, here, I'm going to talk to you about two things that I wish to God I could turn back the clock and do better in, okay? Okay? Before we get to those two things, though, I want you to turn in your Bibles to James 1 or on your smartphones or however you look up God's Word, James 1. Now, James was written by a guy conveniently named James. 
Uh, interestingly enough, he was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Now, how would you like to have Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth as your big brother? Well, in some ways, that'd be really cool. I was a big brother, and at age 20, I literally was convicted, and I had to go to my younger brothers and ask for their forgiveness because I was such a crappy big brother. I mean, I was terrible. I would tease, just torment them. I was terrible, and Jesus convicted me. I couldn't go any further in my spiritual walk until I asked my two brothers to forgive me. And, and it helped my motivation that one of them had become a black belt taekwondo. And so I didn't want him to catch up and make up for all the messing around I did. I asked for forgiveness. Okay. How would you like to have Jesus Christ for a big brother? Well, first of all, he wouldn't tease you or torment you like I did. But on the other hand, do you think it would ever get old <laughs> to have Mother Mary say to you, how come you can't be like your big brother Jesus? Would that ever get old? The perfect son of God? And amazingly, James, <laughs> come on, James doesn't even believe that his big brother's the son of God until after the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? I can only imagine their interesting Passover dinners. You know, we're, we're list, four of his brothers are listed in Scripture by name. Jude, who wrote another book of the Bible, is one of them. And it says he had sisters. That means at least two, maybe more. We don't know. It doesn't say. But, there, you know, Mary's the matriarch of a pretty large family, at least seven kids or more. And none of them believe Jesus is the Son of God. So can you imagine them around the table? Hey, big Jesus. <laughs> You think you're such a hot shot. In fact, John 7 literally has his brothers razzing him, saying, hey, if you're such a big hot shot, why don't you go to Jerusalem and show off a little bit? They don't believe in him. In fact, at one point, they even come to take him into custody. They think he's lost his mind. But it's after the resurrection that James finally invites his big brother into his heart. <laughs> what a dynamic. And he becomes the pastor of old First Church Jerusalem, and he writes this book. And I love James. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's, it's, it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And James 1, he gets right to the point. Now look at this. He goes, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So he's talking about the word here, right? Verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Verse 25. We're in James 1, 25. Here we go. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become, watch this, a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, that man shall be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed in everything you do? Joshua 1, 8 and Psalm 1, verse 2 and 3, tell us that if we will meditate on God's word day and night, we will be successful in everything we do. That means pastoring this church. That means in your marriage. That means in your job. That means in planning for retirement. That means being a grandparent. Whatever you are, whatever you do in life, you'll be successful according to God's standard if you'll put his word first, meditate on it day and night. And right here, if we will become an effectual doer of the word, we will be successful. We'll be blessed in everything we do. Would you like to have that heavenly blessing, that heavenly advantage on earth in every relationship, in everything you ever do? and how you handle money. I mean, just everything. Wow. And I'm here to tell you, I believe that within the church of Jesus Christ, all across the board, you are either one of these two. You are either a forgetful hearer or an effectual doer of the word. And I'm going to tell you that about 90-some percent of most churches that believe the Bible, that believe God's word is true, are forgetful hearers. Really. I know what I'm talking about. I've been a pastor almost 50 years. I know what I'm talking about. I've had people literally tell me in the parking lot, right after I've given them one of my scintillating sermons, <laughs> that I work hard. On, we work hard on these sermons, believe it or not. We really do. And I've had people say, oh, pastor, that was such a blessing. Really? Did God speak to you through? Oh, yes. 
what did I, what did I preach about? We just walked out of church. What are, and they go, uh, 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 Jesus. And I just want to lay hands on people and just come here and let me slap your face. I'm serious. It's unbelievable. We forget. We are forgetful hearers. And I've had the living God say to me in my private time, my people, I love them. But they're forgetful hearers for the most part. In fact, educational theorists and people who study communication and retention rates and all of that, they've come up with some scary statistics, Pastor. This is going to break your heart. Pastor Robert, are you listening to me? This is going to break your heart. Did you know that 95% of what you preach on Sunday morning will be forget, forgotten by your people by Wednesday night? 95%. And the 5% they remember is probably some joke you shouldn't have told. This is scary. This is terrible. Maybe that's why in my tribe, the Church of Nazarene, we had to have Wednesday night church because everybody forgot what happened on Sunday. And it's just, come on. This is pathetic. And in fact, in Mark 4 and other places, we find out that the Bible says that Satan and his demons literally grab the word out of our hearts before it can take root and steal it away. So it's not just our little forgetful craniums, but it's the enemy working diligently to make you forget everything of worth that you heard Rob preach about this morning. Forgetful hearers or effectual doers. And I'm here to tell you that for much of my 60 years, even though I've got a pretty good memory, I would have to fall into the classification of forgetful hearer for the most part. Really. I sat my little two, I have a bunch of grandkids, and I sat two of them down, a 10-year-old boy and a 7-year-old boy, a couple of weeks ago, months ago, and I asked them a question. I told them about this. I read this passage to them. And I said, guys, how can we guarantee that we'll remember what Jesus tells us? Can you think of any ways... I, was, I said, I think I can think of two ways that will guarantee that whatever Jesus tells me, I'll never forget. And that I'll do it. I'll actually do it. Because I don't want to be a forgetful hearer. Are you with me? Okay, now. Believe it or not, these two little boys got it. One said one thing, and the other said the other. I said, wow, well, praise God. I couldn't believe it. My two little boys actually could guess what I was aiming at. One said, well, I think if you did this, the first one said, if you do it right away. I said, oh, that's good. That's, yeah. But a lot of what God says to us, we can't necessarily do it right away. You know, church dismisses and, and you're going out to eat and people are talking to you and maybe God told you to um, make restitution for something you stole 10 years ago. And maybe you just really can't do it right this second, but you mean to. You have a good heart. You heard God speak, and you, and you want to obey. A Christian is somebody who does what Jesus says, right? And by the way, we're told, George, we're told that we're supposed to make disciples of Jesus that do everything he commanded us to do. That's a great commission, isn't it? And we said already from Luke's gospel that when we've done everything Jesus has told us to do, we're supposed to call ourselves unworthy slaves. And like I told you, I'm not even up to that level yet. Much of the church are good-hearted people who've prayed a prayer, who love the Lord, who want to go to heaven, who will love God's word, who would never disobey Jesus on purpose. But in reality, we're forgetful hearers. So unless you can do it right away, you better do the second thing I'm going to suggest, okay? Now, let me just back up before I tell you what that is. Moses was given some instructions on how to build the very first worship center, the tabernacle. Now, how many times does God have to say something before we figure it's important? Is, is once good enough? you will find 50 chapters in your Bible on the construction of the tabernacle 
and the worship that was to go on there. 50 chapters, that's a lot. And God is going to give Moses specific specs on how to build the tabernacle. I mean down to the inch. So many bars, so many boards. Make this out of this cloth and and form this artifact out of this and, and make this just so big, so long. And 18 different times in the book of Exodus it says, Moses did it exactly the way God commanded him on the mountain. Now how does an old man at age 80... He he keeps having to go up the mountain. In fact, I've counted in Scripture eight different times he calls the old man to go up the big mountain, 80 years of age. One time he calls him up and he says, now go down and tell your people not to come up on the mountain. (laughs) I think if I'd have been Moses, I'd been a little sassy. I might have said something like, why couldn't you have told me that down there? (laughs) But no, there's no sass in his presence, have you noticed? In the glory of the consuming fire, there's no sass. So he goes down. But on the mountain, God's going to give him specific instruction, chapter after chapter. You can read it. It reads like a phone book, and most of us kind of blip through it. But he goes down the mountain, and they construct this moving worship center, the tabernacle, this tent with all these specific instructions. And he does it exactly according to the pattern that was given to him, which, by the way, is the pattern of the worship in heaven. 18 times it says, Moses did it exactly the way God told him to do it. Now, how did the old man get it done? How did he remember how many (laughs) cubits this is, how big this is? How did he remember that? Anybody have a suggestion? How did he how did he how did he get it done? He he wrote it down. Yeah, he wrote it down. We call it Exodus. He wrote it down. Oh my goodness. I told you this is a session that's very, very, very practical. The Lord's also told me there are many people in this room who will not pay any attention. In fact, you'll forget it before you get out to the parking lot because you didn't write it down. By the way, the very fact that Moses could write it down is somewhat of a minor miracle. Because in the ancient world, you didn't teach slaves to read and write. In fact, in America, one of our sorriest chapters of the slavery we had in the South, you didn't want to teach your black slaves to read and write. In fact, there were cruel masters who if they found out that a slave could read and write, they would kill them. Rather than using them as an effective servant, they killed them because they knew that reading and writing was a ticket to liberty. They'd read the Bible. And these cruel masters would rather tell them what the Bible says than have their people read it. They would literally kill African slaves here in America if they could read and write. So Moses is born a slave, remember? But he knows how to read and write at age 80. How did that happen? Do you remember? Yeah, he grew up in Pharaoh's palace, didn't he? Remember the bulrushes and all that little boat and everything, all that stuff? God works it out 80 years ahead of time that his man will be able to read and write. And he may have been the only literate person in a crowd of three to five million Jews. He may have ended up teaching Joshua and the boys during the 40 years walking around Mount Sinai how to read and write their own language. Many missionaries, you know, will go into a jungle country like New Guinea where they have like 800 languages and they'll teach the people how to read and write their own language. They'll listen to it. They'll try to teach them how to read and write their own language. Moses learns how to read and write growing up. And by the way, isn't it interesting that of all the cultures on planet Earth, 3,500 years ago, one of the leading cultures on the planet in reading and writing were the Egyptians with their papyri and all that business. Isn't that something? God knew his man was going to need to know how to read and write 80 years before he needed to write anything, really. Wow. And he wrote it down. And in fact, listen to this. Exodus 24.4 astounds me. Here's what it says. Moses wrote down all 
the words Yahweh, that's the name of our God, Yahweh spoke to him. He wrote down every word. Exodus 24, verse 4. Every single word. We call it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible, Moses wrote it all down. Think about that. And I, can I suggest to you that when you prove to God that you will take his word seriously, seriously enough to actually slow down and write it down, he's going to download more to you. As opposed to if he's been speaking to you continuously, and he does that all the time, by the way, his spirit is speaking to his kids all the time. But most of us are forgetful hearers. And if you haven't done the last 15 things Jesus has told you to do, why should he tell you the next 15 things to do? In fact, that would only put you under further condemnation, and you don't need any more of that, do we? Write it down. In fact, I came up with a little phrase, get it down to get it done. Get it down to get it done. That's what Moses did. He actually wrote it down. All the words, all these instructions, all, every, every command, like the Ten Commandments, he wrote it down. By the way, so did God. God wrote it down on the tablets of stone with his finger. Remember? Wow. I can show you at least 25 places in Scripture where God says, write it down. He says that to Jeremiah. He says that to Ezekiel. He says that to Daniel. He says that to John in the Revelation. Write it down in Habakkuk. Write down the vision so others can run with it. And he would tell Moses more than once, write all these words down. And Moses did. My biggest single regret in 60 years of walking with Jesus is I didn't journal more faithfully. Now, I've got shelves of journals I'd do it for two or three years, then I wouldn't do it for six. Then I'd do it for five years. Then I wouldn't do it for ten. Then I'd do it for three more. Then I've got shelves of journals, but my biggest regret is I didn't write down everything Jesus told me. I'll tell you my second biggest regret in a little bit here. He wrote it down. God told him to, and he did it. Now, folks, let me give you some illustrations of how important this really is. I've been a pastor almost 50 years, but 30 of those years I served as a reserve chaplain in the United States Navy. That meant I served on ships, on bases, and the Navy provides the chaplains for the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps, and I served five years in each of those groups as well. Okay? And five days a week, Monday through Friday, on every single base, every single ship, the same thing happens. It's called staff meeting. And the officers, and I was an officer as a chaplain, we all gathered in the staff meeting room. And we were all there 15 minutes early. Because in the military, if you're not there 10 minutes early, you're late, and they will write you up, and it'll cost you your career. I'm serious. They're that serious about punctuality. And we're all standing around, as the military say, it would say, milling about sharply. And um, everybody's looking down the hallway, and the very first person who sees the commanding officer walking in for the 8 o'clock staff meeting shouts three little words that bring us all to immediate attention. Attention on deck! We all stand. And they walk in, and typically they say, at ease, everybody sit down. So we all sit down, and here's what happens next. I saw this happen countless times in all three branches that I served. Everybody whips out of their back pocket a little green government issue notebook about this size. Everybody whips it out. And the old man or old woman, I don't think you ought to call a commanding officer who's a lady an old lady, uh, that probably won't work, will start right in on their left and they'll say, all right, what do you got, chaps? I'm a chaplain. What do you got, doc? Right around, supply, intelligence. Boom, boom. And all the way around the room, there may be 25 people in the room, everybody reads out of their little green assignment book. And what are they reading? They're reading the command the old man gave yesterday. Sir, you asked me to get four buses because we're going to the range tomorrow at 0400. The four buses are ready to roll. Great. All right, supply, what do we got? Well, sir, you told me to make sure that we had 10,000 rounds of ammunition. We got that all lined up. It'll be at the range. Great. All right. 
boom, boom, boom. Everybody's reading out of their assignment book and giving an accounting. I got that done. I got that. Yes, sir. You told me to do this. I got that done. They know that failure to obey even one command is grounds for a court martial, and you can go to jail if you don't do what the old man told you to do. And they go all the way around. Everybody's reading out their little green book. And nobody's trusting their memory. Because somebody once said that the smallest pencil is mightier than the greatest memory. It's true. Then they go all the way around the room. Everybody's reporting in on what they were commanded to do yesterday and what they did about it. And you didn't want to walk in there and say, well, boss, I can't remember what you told me to do. There's no such thing as forgetful hearers in the military. I'm serious. Your whole career is on the line here. And you are going to give an accountability. And because you know you're giving accountability, you get it done. And I've literally seen officers in a big panic because they couldn't find their little green assignment book. And they are just, I mean, they are wetting their togas. It's unbelievable. They're just, ah, until they find their book. Okay? Now, the next thing the old man does, happens everywhere, is he starts in again, right around the table, this time giving the new command for you, for you, for you, for tomorrow. And everybody's writing it down because nobody trusts their memory. Are you with me? Can I suggest to you that we answer to a much higher pay grade than some silly commanding officer? And yet most Christians sit in church, listen to a God-appointed message, don't even bother to take notes, and will forget 95% of what they hear within three days. Wow. Wow. And these officers get it down to get it done. And there's no question in their mind. There's no fuzziness. There's no ambiguity. If they're not clear on the command, they'll ask for clarification right there. And they write it down. And they carry that little book. It's their precious little Bible. Because it tells them what they're supposed to do. And they know they're going to give an answer tomorrow, one way or the other. And again, we have a much higher accountability, don't we? And by the way, we deal with eternal souls in the Christian walk, after all. Now, let me flip the analogy a little bit. Let's imagine that you get a tweet from President Trump. Now, I don't care what you think about him. That's not important to the story. Does he tweet? I don't know. I've heard that he does. All right, so... Or he calls you up. Let's imagine President Trump calls you up, and you know it's really him. And he says, I have picked you out. Pastor Jordan, my aides tell me that you're the man I need to deal with right now. I'm going to fly you to the White House. I'm going to have 10 minutes with you. I'm going to give you 12 bullet points, things you need to do for your country and for Boise that I'm asking you to do. I'll tell you these 12 things. I'm going to send you home, and I'm going to give you all the resources of the federal government that you need to get done, what I'm asking you to do. And in six months, I'm going to call you back to the Oval Office, and you're going to report in to me how, what you did on these 12 points. Now, again, what do you, what do you think of Trump is, is immaterial? Can you imagine Jordan going there and trusting his memory? Or do you think you might want to write it down? what he says to you. I, I would. I would consider it a tremendous honor. I don't care what political affiliation or whatever. If it had been President Obama and he'd asked me to come, I'd have gone. And I'd have written it down because I want to come back and give a good accounting to my boss. Does that make sense? I'm glad Isaiah wrote it down. And Jeremiah. And Ezekiel. And Daniel. And David, the Psalms, you're reading somebody's prayer journal when you read the Psalms. So my biggest single regret in 60 years of walking with Jesus, I didn't more faithfully journal. Let me tell you my second biggest regret. It has to do with it. I got all these shelves of journals. I had a library of over 10,000 volumes. I gave 80% of it away when I joined this ministry. We still have a garage full of books. Connie says next time around, she's going to marry an illiterate. She says, I'm tired of dragging these books around. 
I, I think she's kidding. Okay. I got all these journals, but they're of almost no practical good to me unless I read through them all again. And I don't have time to do that. And I'm not going to haul them around with me. I already carry too many books with me on this trip. I travel for a living. I'm in hotels 300 nights a year. Come on. How many of you journal? You faithfully journal. God bless you. I hope this is encouraging to you to keep it up and keep faithful. But unless you have a system to retrieve what you've written down, they're of almost no practical good to you. And when you have years of them, I'm not going to read back all through all of them. This year, the Lord gave me a very practical answer. A $7 journal. I bought it, Walmart, blank pages. This is my index. So today, I was taking notes in my journal of Pastor Rob. And I got down those qualities of an agape church. I wrote that down. That's really good. My pages are numbered. And so what I did is in my index, I wrote Rob McCorkle, Agape Church Qualities. And I wrote down page 342. I can find it in seconds, six months or six years from now. I just created a little index for me. This is my second biggest regret, that I didn't figure out an index system before now. So I've been doing it this year. And it's been amazing. I can find anything that God has said to me in the last nine months within five seconds. He gave me a, a vision once of a church. And I wrote the vision down in my journal. It's kind of interesting. In the journal, I said, Jesus, what, do you, what, do you, what are you going to do in this church we were in? And, and I saw a vision of Jesus walking through the congregation and everybody he touched grew big Mickey Mouse ears kind of comical, okay? I said, Lord, what's this mean? He said, I'm going to give these people the ability to hear my voice better than ever. Wow. So I wrote down Mickey Mouse vision. I, I, I wrote a little paragraph on that in my journal. Then I indexed it. I can find Mickey Mouse vision within six seconds. I can go back to the page I wrote it down, and I can retrieve anything God said to me or shown me. I can tell you definitively every command that I've been conscious of that Jesus has told me in this year. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just trying to tell you I found a tool that works for me. Maybe you want to do it on the computer and a spreadsheet, and all, whatever. But figure out a way to retrieve what God's telling you. And again, I think if we demonstrate to the Lord how serious we're going to take his, his instructions to us, he's going to give us more. Does that make sense? But I want to ask a practical question. Let's just be honest. We're just, we're just family here. How many of you can say, I can for sure tell you every command that God has given me in 2017, these last nine months? I, I can tell you every command. Probably not. I can not only tell you every command he gave me that I was conscious of, I can tell you if I've done it or not. Because, see, I just developed a little color code system. And any command he gives me, whether I'm sitting in church or I'm in my own private time with Jesus, I write it down and then I underline it in green, like green light go, get it done kind of thing. And I can quickly whip back and see. Because once I've done it, I, I check it off. I check it off. See? See? You can see. I've got green. I wrote in green and I checked it off. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to call Rose today and encourage her to pray with you. Call the flax and the rites and enlist their prayers and fasting. I checked it out. I, I did it. I did it. In fact, I was doing this kind of a concept uh, a month ago or so, and I thought, you know, I ought to go back through my journal and see if I've actually done everything he told me to do. I want to be an effectual doer, not just a forgetful hearer, okay? And I went back, and in 20 minutes, I was able to go through every single page for 2017 and you know what I found out? There were 12 things that I wrote down that I was supposed to do that I hadn't done yet. Oh, I meant to, 
I, I had the best of intentions. Oh, but so I wrote them on another page. Here are 12 things that Jesus told me to do that I haven't quite done yet. Hello. There's no way, Jordan, I could have figured that out if I hadn't written it down. Am I resp- are you responsible for everything God's asked you to do or not? Do you think maybe this, listening to a veteran of 60 years, I'm sorry I didn't do this more, and I wish I'd had a retrieval system, but now I do. In fact, Rob, a couple months ago, we were in Boonville, um, Indiana, and I was getting ready to preach, and the pastor's standing right here praying for me, and I think of an illustration that I'd heard three months earlier from some great preacher like you. I thought, that would go perfect right here. I knew I had it in my journal somewhere, He's praying, and I ah, I want to do it right now. And while he's still praying, I grabbed my index off the front row. I looked it up. Boom, boom, boom. In five seconds, I I read it quickly while he's still praying. I closed my journal. I was able to deliver that illustration. It fit perfectly. I found it in seconds because I had a retrieval system. Ah! You say, do you have to do all this, Craig? No, you don't have to do anything unless you can figure out a better way to be an f- effectual doer. So I asked my two little grandsons, how can we be sure that we'll do whatever Jesus tells us to do? One says, do it right now. Do it immediately. I said, that's so good. And I said, well, can you think of another way? And the other one said, well, maybe if you write it down. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm talking about. Write it down. Get it down to get it done. Okay? Now, I'm going to share with you some reasons why we ought to write it down, all right? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you some reasons, okay? Number one, we're going to whip through this fast. We're going to get done early. You don't forget. The very act of writing causes you to remember at least 30% more of what you hear. If you'll take notes on Pastor Jordan's sermon, you will remember 30% more, just off the bat. Sometimes, some studies say up to 50% more, just, just the fact of writing it down, okay? Number two, you have a hard copy. You can refer to it later, maybe when you can't remember exactly what you thought you heard, maybe months or years later. By having it down, I can go back and read it again. Do you think that Moses, with his instructions on the tabernacle, ever had to refer back to what he'd written down? Do you think he ever had to go, well, well how, how big was that, ta- that, that, that Ark of the Covenant supposed to be? Was it, what? Do you think he ever had to refer back to his notes? I bet it, I bet it helped, didn't it? And by having a hard copy, I can go back. Because, folks, I can promise you something. I know what I'm talking about here. I can hear something so clearly from God, I think I'll never forget that. But if you don't write it down, if I don't write it down, Two weeks from now, it's going to be fuzzy around the edges. And a month from now, it's, it's really gibberish. It's crazy how this works. But again, we have a satanic foe that tries to steal God's specific instructions to us. By having a hard copy, you can refer to it. Number three, by having a hard copy, I can refer it and compare it to God's word. Because I know if I've really heard from the Lord, it won't contradict this book, will it? Are you with me? And oftentimes when I hear something that's pretty dramatic, I'll say, oh God, please give me some some kind of confirming scripture that I can put into my book that will help me here to know that I'm not just losing my mind. Now let me tell you the most faith-filled thing I do every day. It won't sound very dramatic, but it's the most faith-filled act I ever do. I start off, I give him what I call first love. And I love on him. I write him a love letter in my journal. And then I ask him, I just say, Lord, I'm just your little boy trying to listen. And I'll pray the prayer of little boy Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Remember little boy said that? And then I write two words. This is the most faith-filled act I do. Here's what I write. Dear Craig. Why is that faith-filled? Because I am expecting the living God to talk to me now. Right now. 
Oftentimes I'll do spiritual warfare prayers, say, Father, I don't want to hear my own thoughts. I don't want to hear demonic lying spirits. I don't want to hear the opinions of others. I only want to hear your voice now. And I'll write, Dear Craig. By the way, you don't have to do this, but I use different colored ink. I got about 19 different colors. Just went down here to Office Depot and you know, I have a color, black is me talking to God. Red is scripture. Dark blue, that's God off the Father speaking to me. Purple ink is Jesus talking to me. Did you know that the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have different voices? Yeah. I use a light blue for the Holy Spirit when he talks to me. Orange is the promises. Green is commands. Yellow is conviction of sin. Brown is ideas. I mean, it's, I just, I write these different things. So as I just whip through my journals, you can see. So this is me talking to God. This is God talking to me. This light, this lime green, that's when a great speaker speaks and I want to write down the words. So I wrote down, I wrote down Renner's quote that you had up there on the wall. I actually wrote it down a couple months ago in Indianapolis. I was able to find it instantly and see if I got it all right. I did. I did. <laughs> I'm showing my God that I'll take what he says to me seriously. Amen. And I, let, I write down his love letter to me. Now let me tell you some other advantages to writing it all down. Not only can you compare it to the word of God, but now I can take it, let's say, let's say the Lord tells me something really crazy. I can take it to somebody wiser than me in the Lord, like Danny or somebody, and I can say, this is what I thought I heard Jesus say. Does this sound like the Lord or am I just losing my mind hearing voices? And I've had godly pastors just start weeping and say, oh, oh, Craig, that's Jesus. That's so confirming. Wow. Let me give you another reason. You can share it with others and they'll be greatly encouraged in the Lord. Or you can even submit it to a group of godly Christians, spirit-filled believers that you trust and say, does this sound like the Lord or not? I'm so grateful I live with a team of six or eight of us that travel around the country. And so many times in our times of, we try to meet daily, we don't get to do that every time when we have to travel, but, but three or four times a week we get together. And Danny will read something out of his journal. Or I could say, guys, this is what I think I heard. Does this sound like the Lord? And to hear it, the confirmation of spirit-filled people say, oh, yes, great, that's right on. That really encourages me. And I promise you, if I didn't have it written down, I'd be hesitant to share in too much detail. Every member of our team writes it down. I'm telling you, folks, this thing really works. You know what this becomes? It becomes your assignment book. And you can quickly find out if you've paid attention and actually become an effectual doer or are you just a forgetful hearer, like the majority of people you sit in church with, okay? But it becomes, and you can quickly check up on yourself and see if you've done what he told you to do. Get it down to get it done. Does that make sense? Here's another point. Later, if things are really getting tough, and they will be, if you obey God, I can promise you, Pastor Jordan, things will get tough. If you obey what Jesus tells you to do, Satan and all of his demons are going to come against you. What a blessing is this to go back and reread what he told you to do. In fact, there are times I'll just say, God, will you please confirm? Because I'm hitting a lot of stuff. And did I really hear you right? This is what I thought I heard you say three weeks ago. I'm trying to obey, and it's not easy. Lord, would you please confirm, did, you really, did I really hear right? And you know what? He's faithful. He'll tell you if you heard wrong or misinterpreted what he said earlier. There's been times he's clarified. No, Craig, I said this. Oh, this is what I meant. Oh. Most of the time, though, he'll say, Craig, you heard me exactly right. Folks, this could be a matter of life and death. And in my case, it really was. Those of you who are here this morning, I told you about an incident on Palm Sunday where I almost killed myself because of my diabetes, my blood sugar dropped so low, I almost slipped into a coma. It's a miracle I'm alive. My team would have had a memorial service for me. Well, a week later, it's Easter Sunday morning, and I wake up, and I'm listening to the Lord, and he says, Craig, I'm giving you a, a, a resurrection day gift. I'm totally healing your diabetes. Don't take your medication anymore. 
because he's, here's what's been happening. For a year and a half, Danny's been praying over me almost every night that I'd be healed of my diabetes, and yet I was still taking diabetic medication that would bring my numbers down. If God was healing me and I continued to take the medication, can you see why it would drive it through the floor? which it had done on Palm Sunday. Now, Easter Sunday, he says, don't take your medication anymore. You're done. Do you understand? If I keep on taking the medication when he's already healed me, it could kill me, life and death. I'm not just making this stuff up. Are you with me? So the first five or six days, my numbers were perfect. Praise Jesus, he really did heal me. I did hear from him. But on day seven, my numbers spiked. I'm not taking on medication. What, 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 this, what, what's going on here? Did I hear right? It's been only seven days, but I thought I heard him say, don't take your medication. Has he really healed me? (laughs) How come my numbers are high? How many of you know that when you obey God, you're going to be tested at some point? What did he say to me? Well, it was quite easy. I looked it up. I reread what he said. On, he said God, you said you healed me. I thought I heard you say you healed me and don't take my meds. Father, did I hear you right or wrong? I don't mind. You know, there's only one person on planet Earth who claims infallibility when it comes to listening to God. That's the Pope. He says when he hears from God, he's infallible. The rest of us are trying to figure it out and muddle through. And God, did I really hear? And I heard the Lord say to me, Craig, you heard me right. I have healed you. Don't take your meds. I've heard him confirm that at least five times in the months since. Oh, I'm so glad I had a hard copy. Does this make sense? Let me go on. Let me go on quickly. Here we go. You will have a collection. This will fortify your faith and empower you with boldness to keep on keeping on and to follow through with obedience no matter what the numbers might say. You'll have a collection of God's commands to you, his promises, his blessings, his miracles, his love letters to you. And let me just encourage you, get alone with Jesus with your little book. And by the way, I used to write down things that God would say to me on little scraps of paper, and that's almost useless. They get lost, you can't find them, they're all over the place. It's just, it's it's worthless. But now I've got it all in one book. Anything God says to me goes in this book. In fact, I was really beside myself. Last night I got here and I forgot my book back in the hotel. I couldn't. I won't do that again. But to have a collection of his love letters. And I suggest you get alone with God and you ask questions like this. God, what do you think of me? You will be stunned with the incredibly intimate love language he pours into your heart. You can hear God speaking. You can hear Jesus pray. I've said, Jesus, I don't know how to pray for this guy. Let me hear you praying. I'll write down what you're praying, and I'll pray your prayers on earth as it is in heaven. I want to hear you. Robert Murray McShane was a great man of God in Scotland, and he wrote these words. He says, it wouldn't matter to me if there were 10,000 men outside my door waiting to arrest me, torture me, and kill me, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room. Did you know you can hear the Holy Spirit praying for you? You can hear Jesus praying for you? And when I write down what I hear Jesus praying for Connie, do you think that makes a difference in how I can pray for her? Wow. Wow. You have a collection of it. It becomes a journal, your log of an incredible faith journey of an adventure. When you write down what God tells you, you're obeying at least 30 commands from Scripture where God tells us to write down what he says to us. John was told to write down the words of the Revelation. God commanded Moses, Jeremiah, Daniel, many others to write down his words. If they hadn't, we'd have no Bible. We we would have no Bible. He told Matthew, write it down. (laughs) Now, I'm not suggesting that what you write down is the equivalent to Scripture. I get it. But you know what? I'm glad somebody wrote it down. I'm glad Isaiah didn't just keep all that good stuff to himself. All right, by having a writing, you can ask God for further confirmation and clarification if you're unclear or uncertain about what you thought you heard. That's what I did. I had to do that a week after Easter. God, did I really hear you? Because my life depended on whether I took those meds or not. Are you with me? If I thought, well, I just better start taking my meds. When God said, don't, and God says, I've healed you already, those meds could have killed me dead. You can clarify. God's not offended when you come back to him and say, 
I thought I, said, I thought I heard you say this. Did you really say that? Let me make up a story. This is a totally made-up story. We had a bunch of boys, and then we had a daughter. We adopted a little girl when she was one day old. She's now 29. Imagine that she's 10. It's a Saturday. Now, this is fantasy land for sure. Imagine she came to me and says, Daddy, I just love you so much. I want to please you. Is there something I can do for you? This is fantasy land, okay? <laughs> it did not happen. And I said, baby, listen, you know what? I got a funeral, and I got to drive my car up to the graveside, and it's dirty, and I don't have time to wash it. I've taught you how to wash the car. Would you wash the car for me? Imagine she says, yes, Daddy, I just want to please you. About 20 minutes later, she comes back to me and says, now, Daddy, I'm a little confused. I can't remember exactly. Did you say wash the car? Because if you did, I've got everything outside ready to wash the car. Or did you say paint the car? Because I found some house paint, and, and it's white, and, and I, I'll paint the car if you want me to. I just want to please you, Daddy. I just want to hear clearly. Can you imagine me grabbing her and slapping her about the head because she didn't get it right the first time? Or my little daughter who wants to please me, can you imagine me clarifying, honey, wash the car. Let's put the paint away. We're not painting the car today. Wash. I think God is honored when we come back to him and say, please, dear Abba, I just want to please you. I thought I heard this. Did I hear right? If not, correct me. I'm not the Pope. I'm not infallible. Please, just teach me what you want me to know. When you write it down, you demonstrate to God, I think that you really love him and take his word seriously and you really want to obey him and he'll give you more. I think it helps you focus better on him when you write it down. The very act of concentrating, listening, slowing down, force, forces you to focus 15, I think you will obey quicker and better and more thoroughly and not forget what he told you to do. Or you will know that you haven't obeyed yet. That was kind of an eye-opener the other day. When I went back through my journal for the last nine months and found there's at least 12 or 15 things I haven't done yet. And I'd completely forgotten all of them. Most of what he told me to do, I had done. But there were 12 things. So now I can go to God and say, now God, do you still want me to do those things? He told me to learn Farsi. That's the language of Iran. He told me that in IHOP there in Kansas City. Learn Farsi. Yeah. I bought the Rosetta Stone and I did one lesson that was harder than I thought it was going to be. And I... God, do you still want me to learn Farsi? See, I can confirm. I can come back. I can clarify. I can deal with God. I can ask for forgiveness. It forces you to slow down. Here's a phrase that Dan came up with. I love this. Slow down to catch up to Jesus. Slow down to write it down. Write it down to slow down. It forces me. I'm, I'm the kind of guy that goes Mach 5 with my hair on fire. <laughs> and the Lord just says, slow down. Listen to me. Shut up. He says it in love. Just like he said to Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. Shut up. Just listen. Slow it down to write it down, write it down to slow down. We will not be forgetful hearers, but effectual doers. I believe when we write it down, we literally stop Satan and his demons from stealing God's seed word from our hearts. Because Jesus says that happens. I think that happens all across our churches. Most of the people you preach to, Marissa, will have the word stolen from their heart before they can obey it. By writing it down, you at least have a record there, okay? All right. I think we bring God's word or voice from the supernatural realm into the natural realm where we live when we actually take the time to write it down. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Our restoration and ability to move forward is contingent upon our obedient action to write down what the Lord has done and said and to pass it on to our families and to others. That's what Jeremiah is told to do. I think it takes God's dream destiny that's his will for us. And from simply being a dream or desire of his, and it brings it down to a physical realm where we can write it down and take action. Habakkuk 2, write the vision down so you can do it and others can follow you. That's important. All right. I believe it becomes God's destined purpose for us. It becomes a roadmap or, or a blueprint or action plan for us. How many of you know that this pastor needs to sit alone with God and get 
the action plan for what's the next step for River House. And if God downloads stuff to him, do you, do you want him to remember it? Or just kind of be fuzzy when he talks to the staff about it, when he tries to convey the vision to the church? Or would it be helpful to actually have it written down? So Habakkuk, write the vision down <coughs> so others can run with it. Wow, that's important, huh? The men and women that God is speaking to today the most, and the people who are having the most impact for God on the planet, virtually all of them write it down. I'm serious. I'm serious. And when you go back in church history, people like John Wesley, David Brainer, George Whitfield, you just, I mean, Hudson Taylor, start down the list of the great men and women of faith, and you'll find out, guess what? They wrote it down. They wrote it down. When you journal, you avoid my two biggest mistakes. Remember, I didn't journal faithfully, and I didn't figure out a way to retrieve things until this year. I think your journal will serve you as a reminder of the long-term sanctification process God's got you on and how it's helping you become more and more like Jesus every day. In fact, when you go back and read it, <laughs> you're going to be embarrassed at how, you know, when, you read, when I read a journal from 20 years ago, I'm embarrassed at how selfish and immature and self-focused my praying and intercessions were. And it encourages me to think, wow, by God's grace, I've come a ways. But by God's grace, I've got a long way to grow yet to become like Jesus. I think it helps you think better and think clearer when you have to f articulate on paper what's in your heart. You will think better, write better, and communicate better for having taken the time to discipline yourself to write down your heart language to God. Aren't you glad David did? That's the Psalms, really. It ha it, writing actually helps you become a better writer. And who knows when God may call you, Rob, to write a book that will change the world. You know? You actually are listening better. In journaling, I save quotes from others, articles, inspiring stories, something I, a statistic I read somewhere, ideas from sermons. You collect wisdom. Did you know the Bible tells us to collect wisdom? How can you do that if you don't catalog it, write it down? Figure out a way. You begin to build an Ebenezer. <coughs> A reminder of all the incredible things God has done for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Your journal may become the greatest gift you ever give to your children and grandchildren. Great grandchildren, if Jesus tarries, great grandchildren you may never meet may someday come to faith because they read your journey. Long after I'm gone, if Jesus doesn't come back, my great grandchildren might. Get their hands on these. And they could see how Poppy, what Poppy lived and died for. My great-grandparents helped found the Church of the Nazarene 100 some years ago. We don't have their journals. I'd give anything to read their journey. I'd get such faith and joy and learn so much to hear. To see, but, they, but if they kept a journal, we don't have it. It's gone. My kids are going to Have something. Believe it or not, scientists will tell you that this will help keep your brain healthy and young by thinking about your day, doing the post-game analysis. You know, when a, when a team wins the Super Bowl, they celebrate for about 48 hours, and then the coaches are studying the game film because they know every other coach in the NFL is studying to find out how to beat them next year. So they're studying, okay, we won, great, but what can we do better? And this becomes a post-game analysis for you, that the Holy Spirit, and you can think through your day. How did your day go? Did you obey or not? I honestly believe it'll help you become much more like Jesus because you're consciously evaluating. It causes you to slow down and pay attention to your lover, Lord. It'll help you count your blessings. Folks, I can go on and on. There are so many advantages to writing it down. Now, if you want, I've got all 44 of these reasons 
if you like, we can make copies of these and give them to you tomorrow. Anybody want this? Okay, there's a few, few hands. So can I, can, I, can I give this to you? And uh, for a very small fee, we will... Um, no, I'm giving them away free. I'm giving them away free. Are there any questions? It's 3.03, and we're going to quit. We're going to get out of here early. But do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I'm going to. I'll do that before we get done, Danny. That's a good point. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And you know, it'll by writing it down and then rereading it, it'll it'll come clearly to you. Oh, but that's me. That's not Jesus. That's just me. Good point. Thank you. I saw another hand. Yes. How much time? Well, some days it's not much. Travel days, you know, we get up early, we get going. Uh, sometimes I catch it in the evening. Uh, some days I don't do it at all. But I, my happiest days are when I can spend at least a page in my journal of me writing my love letter to my Lord and at least a page or two when he talks to me. But really, it's up to him, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Well, I'll have two indexes. So what I did, I'll just tell you real simple. It's, they're blank pages, okay? So what I did is I just used the alphabet, A, and I gave four pages to A. Then I have B, and I just write down, so this says, uh, blood sugar healed. Oh, remember I just told you about that? That's on page 50 in here. I can go there, boom. My journal pages are numbered. I'll just keep continuous. So someday there'll be 3,495 pages, okay? See, I'll just keep going. And so what I've done is I've also got a scripture index. So the other day, Danny gave us a great insight from Matthew 18. That goes into the scripture index. So I can quickly, oh, that was on page 341. Okay, boom, I can find that. Just a practical tool. Now, this index will fill up. So I will eventually have to carry two indexes with me. But for most of you all, that's not a big problem. You're not traveling around like we are. But we have a trailer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I, will, I will have filled up this, this whole journal for this one year, okay? But I, I'm just trying to find a way. Now, again, some of you say, well, can't you just do it on the computer? And I could do it faster on a computer. I really could. And, and there are programs that will index things naturally for you. Some of you are already thinking ahead of um, spreadsheets and stuff. That's wonderful. For me, I needed the discipline of hardcore handwriting. That slows me. I need to slow down to hear his voice better. By the way, a little interesting thing. In Deuteronomy, it says that every king of Israel was to hand copy their own copy of God's word. And it said that they would always fear the Lord and they, would, they, they had no excuse. They would have written down at least the first five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Just like Moses wrote down, they were supposed to hand copy. Now they could have been king. They said, all right, you 55 scribes, you write it down. No, they were supposed to do it themselves. There was something about the discipline and the effort. You're looking at it two or three times to make sure you have it right. It's going in the eye gate. You're writing it down through your fingers. They were supposed to write down God's word. By the way, God said there were three things that kings were not to multiply. They weren't to multiply wives. They weren't to multiply horses, which would have been depending on military strength. And they weren't to multiply money. And guess what Solomon multiplied? Wives, money, and horses. Yeah. Wow. Maybe he didn't write down God's word. There were kings, we find out, that they discover the word of God somewhere and they hear it for the first time. In other words, they didn't do what God's word said to do. Maybe they were forgetful hearers. Is this kind of a tragedy when you really think about the state of the church that we've got a whole bunch of good people that love God, who maybe give money and, and really want to go to heaven and, and believe the Bible's true, but they're forgetful hearers. We've got to figure out ways, pastors, to help our people become forgetful hearers. So in the words of my two grandsons, either do it right now. Or write it down so you can do it later, so you won't forget. This is practical. It's so good, Craig. 
So, any other questions? Well, then we'll go home. After I pray a prayer of impartation. Whatever God's given you, you can give to others. It's called impartation. God's helping me develop this, okay? It's This is a real treasure. I can buy another Bible. I can't buy another one of these. That's why it says in here, if found, return for reward. None of you come up here and grab this thing. <laughs> Try to get a reward out of you. Would you stand? Let me pray over you. Rob, let the record show that I was actually given two full hours till four o'clock, but I'm letting the people go home 52 minutes early. Just let the record show. I love this guy. Isn't he, a, isn't, he, isn't he your favorite hobbit? Really? Come on, Rob. Lord Jesus, I want to be an effectual doer of your word. Forgive me for all the year, decades that I heard your voice and didn't bother to write it down and didn't follow through. And God, I just, I'm embarrassed. Forgive me. I want to do better. And Lord, even this little list that I haven't fully done yet from this year, I want to get that done too soon. Now, Jesus, I pray that whatever you've given me, you will bless these precious people who want to become effectual doers. We will all stand before you and give an accounting for everything you've told us to do. And God, I, I want these precious folks who've come out and listened so attentively I want them to become effectual doers of what you tell them to do. Lord, you told me that even one person who takes this seriously could literally change the entire world. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, give these precious people what you've given me. And God, I pray that some of them will think of better ways to catalog and remember and retrieve the things that you've said to them in their heart. May they all hear your voice clearly. May they hear your spirit speaking. May they hear your love language. May they write down what you tell them to do. God, may that give them courage to follow through. And when they check it off, may there be great joy in their heart, knowing they brought you joy. Father, I impart to them everything you've given me in this dimension of listening and writing it down. Help us to get it down so we can get it done for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray.